All right, today I'm going to show you how to match a real-life camera with the virtual camera in Blender. And this is useful um, for putting three-dimensional objects into a, a virtual three-dimensional objects into a photograph of a real three-dimensional space. So like, uh, you know, putting a dinosaur into your school parking lot or something like that. So in order to get started, we've already got our virtual camera in Blender, obviously. There's not much we need to do there in order to actually, you know, have that object. Uh, but we're going to have to change some parameters. We need to know what those parameters are. So uh, we need to know a little bit about the camera that we're going to use. Uh, we need to set up a situation, basically, with known dimensions and known attributes that we can match later in Blender to make sure that those overlay properly. So I'll show you how to do that really quick. I've set up in the, against this garage door the three things that I need to match my real-world camera. In this case, I'm using an iPhone 7 with the virtual camera in Blender. So those three things are, I've got a square of known dimensions. And this square, at least I've marked the corners of a square here with painter's tape. From this corner to this corner is one meter. So it's one meter wide and it's also one meter tall. It's exactly a meter square. I've got the center of this marked out for convenience as well. So I've got this monopod walking stick and I've telescoped it out to where I can set my iPhone on top of it and pretty well have the lens at the height of the center of this square. The third thing I've got marked out is on the floor here, I have a distance of two meters back from this square uh, exactly marked as well. So I can set my monopod and therefore my camera two meters from this square. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, let's get the camera ready to take a picture. I'll set my monopod right in place there. And I'm going to just try to line this square up to center it as well as I can in my image. I'm not zooming at all, by the way. I'm making sure I'm all the way zoomed out. Because otherwise I don't know how zoomed I am. And that, that's important for this image. And then I just take the picture. And we now have our reference image ready for uh, matching in Blender. So let's go see how we do the rest of the process. All right, now that we've got uh, our photo taken, we've got our real world situation pretty well mapped out uh, with known uh, dimensions, uh, we can get to work in Blender. So um, first of all, let's try to kind of match the setup that we had there. So we've got our default cube here, and in Blender, our default cube is uh, two meters by two meters. You can tell that by tapping N on the keyboard, and then over here, whoop, over here under your transforms, you can see the dimensions down here at the bottom, two meters by two meters by two meters. So that's actually a pretty big cube. That's taller than most people. Uh, but we set a uh, we set up a situation where we had uh, a square on the wall on the garage door that was just one meter. So let's change that. Let's go one meter, one meter, one meter. Okay, so there's one meter square, and we can kind of see how our camera is oriented here compared to, sorry, let's go into an orthographic view, five on the numpad. You can see our camera is roughly on this side, so I need to get it all lined up. Um, but let's move this square so that it's exactly along this x-axis so that the front of it sorry, this cube, so that the front of it is, is at zero in Y. Right now on the Y axis, uh, the center of it's in zero. So um, since this is one meter, I know if I move it up in Y by 0.5 meters, just typing up here, that should put the front of it right at zero. We moved it half of its distance. So let's move our camera. Let's get that set up. Um, first of all, uh, we can see the location in X is pretty well off. Let's zero that out. Uh, y, we do need a Y. If you remember, we were two meters away 
from our cube in Y, and this is almost seven meters away. You can even count that with the little squares here. One, two, three, four, five, six, almost seven. So that's minus 6.9 some odd in, in uh, the Y axis. Let's put it to minus two. And then in the Z axis, let's just put it, so let's look at a front view here so we can kind of appreciate. Whoop. I typed on accident, but that was a lot higher up here. It was up around here somewhere. So the, in the z-axis, let's zero that out so that it's right at the center of this cube like we were trying to be with our square. Okay, now the rotation is still wrong, as you can see. It's rotated in z. Let's zero that out. Uh, in y, it's not rotated at all. And in x, it's at kind of this arbitrary 63.6 .6 degrees. Let's put that up to a straight 90 so that it's lined up perfectly with our cube. Now if we look through that camera, you can see that we are lined up perfectly with our cube here, uh, but it still looks a little bit wrong, and that's okay, that's to be expected at this point. So we shot our picture uh, with an iPhone 7 Plus. And let's look a little bit at the uh, specifications on an iPhone 7 Plus. Uh, so our camera, if we click on this little camera data icon here, our camera has some parameters that we can play with. Um, we can play with this uh, focal length, which we'll need to, 50 millimeters. I'm certain that that is not what my iPhone uh, focal length was set to. And then down here under camera, we uh, can input a sensor size and 36 millimeters is a full frame camera sensor that's the width of a full frame camera sensor and that is not what is in my iPhone 7 Plus so we're going to change that now a quick Google search will get us pretty close so I noticed in Google searching that uh, in searching Google that the iPhone 7 Plus camera is roughly similar to the iPhone 6, which is about a third of an inch, which in millimeters, according to Wikipedia's table here, is about 4.8 millimeters wide. So let's put that number into Blender for our sensor size. So I'm going to say, you know what, this is the horizontal, and we're going to put that, sorry, was it 4.8? Am I I've already forgotten? 4.8, yes, so 4.8 millimeters wide, and I'm not really expecting that to be exact, but it's going to be fairly close. It's a lot closer than we were anyway. The focal length is set to 50 millimeters. Now this gets a little bit complicated, because if you do a Google search for this, iPhone 7 Plus focal length, you see this. The iPhone 7 and 7 Plus each come with a wide-angle camera, the equivalent of a 28 millimeter focal length on a traditional SLR camera. Great, so we can just type in 28 millimeters, right? Well, the answer to that is a definite no. Uh, so 28 millimeter focal length has to do with, uh, if you were to stick this, this lens that it's using over a full 36 millimeter wide full frame sensor, that's roughly the, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm telling that backwards. Uh, so that's roughly, with the smaller sensor in the phone, that is roughly the field of view that it's approximating uh, compared to a 28 millimeter lens on a full frame sensor. But that's not what uh, Blender's actually after. It wants the real focal length. So we can get pretty close to that mathematically. You'll notice here in this uh, chart of sensor sizes that over here we have a crop factor. 7.21 is our crop factor. So all we need to do is take that number by the apparent focal uh, and uh, divide the uh, 35 millimeter equivalent focal length by that number. So 28 divided by 7.21, and that gives us about 3.88. So that's actually the focal length, roughly the focal length of the iPhone lens in. Uh, in, in my actual iPhone. So let's change that. You see, like right now, our camera is super long. If we look through 
our camera, we can't even see the edges of that cube with it. But if we change this to 3.88, then you can see that that looks a little better. That looks a little more reasonable or not zoomed way in. So we've now got our sensor size and our focal length in here. And uh, the next thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to put a background image into our uh, camera view here and we're going to use that reference image that we just took. So I'm going to twirl this down, put a checkbox next to background images and I'm going to add an image. I'm going to click on open, go to my desktop and here I have my image downloaded and you can see my garage door now. So let's do something really quick. Let's uh, Let's see, let's, okay, I'm not being able to see through that. I think I actually, ha I want to be able to see through, oh, you know what, let's just go to a wireframe view. There we go. Okay, I want to be able to see through this um, cube here so that I can see the lines on my garage door. Okay, and you can see that I didn't do a perfect job lining this thing up in the first place. So let's, I'm going to move this cube. I am never going to move it in Y because that would move it closer. And I know the distance of my camera here, but I'm going to G, X, move the cube a little bit. Okay, and you can, oh, <laughs> I messed up. One more thing, one more thing. So... If we go and look at this file, let's click on the properties of this file. If we look at the image width, it's 4032 by 3024 pixels. Well, that is definitely not the aspect that my, uh, my camera view is showing here. So let's go back to our output here. And we need to match that setting. So, sorry, one more time. We're going to go 4032 by 3024 so right now our box is really squashed. So 4032 by 3024. Okay, and that's a little better. You can see we're actually pretty close. Um, we're closer than I thought we were. So I'm going to keep moving this cube around. G, Z, G, X, but I'm never going to move it in Y. Okay, and you can see that that's pretty close to kind of lining up in the corners here. It's not quite there. Um, this corner, this outer corner is where I should be matching up. So what we need to do now is I need to take whichever number I am most sure about in my camera settings this, between the sensor size and the focal length. Uh, I need to choose one of those and decide that I'm pretty sure about it and then I need to start adjusting the other. And in this case, I think I'm going to adjust the sensor size, or I think I'm going to trust the sensor size more than the focal length. Uh, so I'm going to just start sliding my focal length. I'm holding down Shift to get this thing a little closer to, or sorry, to finally adjust. So 3.98 millimeters is looking a little closer to my actual camera size. GZ, let's see what happens if we slide that up just a bit. So that's really close here. It's very close there. And down here, you can see that vertically it's about right but we seem to have some distortion and that's probably because I wasn't quite lined up perfectly with my camera. I was probably turned a little bit. But that's looking really quite close. So I think I should be able to match uh, photographs with that now. So there's my, uh, there's my photographic match. Uh, basically what I've done here is I've built my iPhone camera in Blender so I can turn off my background image now and I can just kind of save these settings I can write these down now one last quick note um, 
you can probably see now why I didn't want to zoom on uh, the iPhone at all because the focal length when it's at its widest seems to be about 3.98 millimeters um, if I were to you know do the finger pinch or finger spread to zoom in or out I would not know what that's at and I wouldn't be able to duplicate it um, so this will work as long as I can you know it, as long as I stay zoomed all the way out likewise if I have a camera on which I can zoom reliably and repeatably um, a consistently repeatable position on my zoom uh, then I can zoom to that and I can figure out how to match that camera those camera settings in Blender as well using the same process but basically I need to be able to go back and say okay I know I'm at the same zoom as I was when I took my reference image so that the cameras will match okay so now what we need to do is throw in a real photo and kinda see how things work so I'm going to delete my default cube and I'm going to construct a sweep here for my photo so got my camera here and I'm just going to add a plane scale it up by about 50 times and then I'm going to move it in the y-axis so it's just kind of barely under my camera here and I think I'll move this camera up GZ about 1.75 meters because that's about how tall I am when I take a picture okay now I'm going to turn this plane into a sweep so I'll tab into edit mode I'm just gonna select this edge here GZ Oop, sorry, <laughs> wrong command, extrude, E, Z. Okay, and we're kind of making a little like drive up theater looking thing for our camera. If we look through our camera view, we can see, well, maybe this whole thing needs to be wider. So S, X to scale in X. There we go. Tab into edit mode again. And actually, before I do that, I'm going to add a modifier. Let's add a subdivision surface modifier. Let's do two levels of subdivision in our viewport as well as render so that we're actually looking at what we render. And I'm going to go to my object mode and I'm going to shade smooth on this. And then tab back into edit mode to kind of help my corners out here so control R we're gonna do a loop cut here and scoot that back into the corner there to make that corner a little bit sharper uh, we don't really want sharp corners but we don't want them to be as shallow as they were looking uh, before so now we'll do some loop cuts on the outer edges here to kind of square that off so that we have a little more surface area there and that's a pretty good looking sweep so I'm pretty happy with that. We've got basically what a what a sweep is is for photography. Uh, it's a seamless background, and that's what we've constructed here is essentially a virtual photography studio for our virtual camera. So I'm going to go over here to my materials tab, create a new material, and just to keep things simple rather than using the principled shader here I'm going to turn that into just a diffuse shader just the diffuse color that's all we want and for the surface or for the color here I'm gonna click on this little dot and select an image texture I'm gonna go to open go to my image one Dot JPEG here that I took with my iPhone. Okay, now if I look at a material view of this, you can kind of see this image, and it's a little bit messed up. It's a little bit weird. And also, uh, we're currently rendering in Eevee, which is nice and fast, 
but it's not very accurate in terms of like matching the lighting here. So I'm going to change this up. I'm going to uh, go to my render settings here and switch my render engine from EV to Cycles. And from here, we need to fix something about this uh, about this sweep. So I'm going to split out my window, right click, split area, and just pull up a shader editor here. So we can see our shader. We've just got our image texture, image texture going into a diffuse shader. Uh, which goes straight into our material output. That's just that's the only thing determining how this looks right now. Okay, so all I need to do really to make this work as a background sweep, and this is such a clever little uh, thing that they have built into Blender, I'm going to add an input node, uh, a, a texture coordinate input node. So click on that, bring it over here, and quite often we've used either the generated or the UV um, outputs here. And what I'm going to do on this one, you'll notice I'm looking through my camera view now. I'm just going to take the window output and click it into my vector input. And you can see that that sort of creates this like weird optical illusion here. Um, but within my camera, it's framing up that photo perfectly and that's exactly what I want. If I tumble out of my camera view you can see that this sweep basically is just acting like a window into the image and when we look through our camera view, our camera view then our camera gets a perfect window view onto the image but it happens to be that sweep. So from na for now um, I can see that the sunlight was almost directly above and behind me on this one, so um, we'll match that in a minute. But let's let's just put something into this photo and see how it looks first. So I'm going to click on my rendered viewport over here, and you can see that that's telling a different story, right? We've got light in the foreground, and our light is really fading as we, as we go away, and that's because if you look, let's. It's a little more clear visually not to look at a material view right now. But you can see we've got a light source here, just a point lamp next to our camera. And that's what we're seeing illuminating our sweep in the foreground. And then the light from that decays. It falls off according to the inverse square law as it goes backward. So Blender has a sun lamp that it can use. So let's change this into a sun lamp. The sun lamp uh, has two interesting attributes. One is that um, the light from it doesn't decay according to the inverse square law. And also its position doesn't matter, just its angle. So I'm going to match roughly where I think the angle of the sun was. And like I say, the position doesn't matter. Uh, when I took this shot, the sun was behind me, pretty much directly behind me and coming down. It was fairly high in the sky. It was, uh, you know, about 1.30 in the afternoon. So now, if I look through my camera and I click on a rendered view, you can see we've gone nuclear, and that's because a sun lamp, it doesn't decay, so a strength of 1,000 is like sticking a lamp right next to everything. So let's turn that down to like 3. And uh, you can see that that's now perfectly evenly lit. You can't really even tell it's on a sweep. That looks good. So I'm going to add a sphere to this scene. And just, again, to be a little less visually confusing, we'll do this in a solid view. So Shift-A, Mesh, UV Sphere. Okay, and we've got a sphere that's just halfway through the sweep. That's because the sweep is, uh, in terms of the z-axis, the sweep is at zero. So G, Z, 1 ought to put it right on top of our sweep there. And let's just G, Y, move that in the y-axis away from us a little ways. Okay, and now if I look through a rendered view, you can see that... That's actually looking pretty good. GX, let's move it over here in front of this truck. There we go. And one of the cool things is, since this photo is actually 
uh, literally the material of the ground. If you zoom in here, you can see that the reflected light on the ground, or from the ground onto this sphere, is the right color. And that looks pretty nice. And that's a pretty good match. And our lines of perspective are roughly, uh, from Blender, are roughly matching the lines of perspective on the sidewalk grid here. So that's looking pretty good. And I could stick just about anything in this photograph and it would look about right. So basically that's how you match a camera in Blender. That's how you match your camera settings. And uh, I hope that comes in handy. It's not the only way to do it. There are certainly uh, better ways to do it for different circumstances. But if you just need a still image, um, this might not work very well for video, for instance. If you're trying to match camera movement, the window could get really the window uh, texture coordinate system could get really weird. But uh, for just making a f or putting a virtual object into a photograph and having it match, this works pretty well. And even, I'll show you one more thing, even if we give this cube, or sorry, this sphere, uh, some reflectance, a degree of reflectance here, uh, then it still reflects about right. Because the ground is actually, uh, the material of the ground is actually this photograph. So I'm pretty happy with that. And I hope that is helpful for you.